What's happening guys? Keith here with another Impact Wrestling Review. So tonight we're going to take a look at the September 6th episode of Impact. Another solid show. Uh, I feel like they've kind of been spinning their wheels since Slammiversary. No real direction with things. Uh, this felt like the weakest show, in my opinion, since Slammiversary. Um, however, we did get a couple matches made for Bound for Glory. One match people seem to be on the fence about. I think it's going to be a fantastic match. However, the way it was made, it's a little bit of a different story, but we'll talk about that throughout the review. Um, so yeah, we opened the show with P.D. Williams versus Rich Swan, and this was a rematch from Redefine, which happened last week, and I know people were complaining about this being a rematch, saying... What happened to all the first-time-ever matches that we're used to seeing? Now we see the same crap over and over, like another promotion we all know. So that was uh, one thing. But generally, if Impact does matches like this, there's generally a reason for it. They they use it to build to something else, and that's kind of what happened here. And to be fair, it was a good match. Last week's match was a solid match, and this week's was the same. Petey Williams and Rich Swan are both very competent competitors, and they're always generally going to put on a good match. Um, we saw some good spots here. Uh, first, I want to note that Matt Seidel did join Don Callis and Josh Matthews on commentary. Um, so the beginning portion of the match, it was almost as if there was no match going on because they weren't focused on that at all. Uh, they had a little banter back and forth with Matt Seidel and Callis, but it was enjoyable. However, it does take away a little from the match, but eh, we did see the match last week, so not the end of the world here. Um, like I said, Swan hits a beautiful 450 off the apron onto a down Petey Williams on the outside. Uh, at this point, Seidel leaves the commentary area. He goes and sits on the entrance ramp. This distracts Swan as he's going for a Phoenix Splash. He ends up missing. Petey capitalizes, hits the Canadian Destroyer, and he gets the victory. So Swan and Petey split in the two matches that they had. So we go backstage, and Rich Swan is absolutely frustrated, obviously. Uh, Seidel meets up with him and tells him not to be angry as he's showing him the way. Swan obviously isn't buying this, and he tells Seidel to stay the hell away from him. So, obviously, I was on board with the two of them having a program. Um, I really think Seidel has developed so much as a character since, I would say, the Callis um, Demora regime started, just because of the fact that he was known pretty much for just being a high-flying guy. He turned heel. He changed his whole uh, move set. Completely different game plan. Then we had that nonsense with him and Josh Matthews, which they actually joked about a little later on when we head to the uh, desk of Don and Josh. But um, just the character development, the whole third eye thing, he completely bought into it. And oh, well, I believe this is Matt Seidel. What we see is what we get with him um, in this aspect anyway. But I feel like since he bought into the gimmick or lives the gimmick, it's so much easier for him to portray that on TV. Uh, but I feel like he's become a cornerstone for Impact Wrestling. And we saw Brian Cage go from, you know, here to here after his feud with Matt Seidel. I know we all saw him being elevated on the card, but I feel like with the feud with him and Matt Seidel really pushed him. Um, we saw him develop as well, and I think we're seeing that from Swan as well. We saw the frustration after the interaction between the two of them, and that's not something we've seen from Rich Swan so far. He's just kind of the happy-go-lucky dancing guy that does awesome shit in the ring, but I think we're going to see some more character development with Rich Swan, and I think that's going to be thanks to Matt Seidel. So, that should be good. Hopefully, that will be a Bound for Glory matchup. Um, still over a month to go. So, um, they go to Mexico next week for the tapings. I think next week is actually the last week televised from the August tapings. And then the week after, we'll have the Mexico tapings. Um, and we have Don and Josh run down the card. And that's when they were joking about the whole spiritual guide that Josh portrayed back in the day, which they dropped very quickly. So up next, we have the Desi Hit Squad versus Joe Hendry and Grado. Joe Hendry comes out singing his platonic love song. Um, Desi Hit Squad attack him right away. Pretty standard tag match here. 
Uh, Rohit Raju pulls Joe Hendry off the apron. Um, they end up hitting a double team. I think it was a knee into a sky high on Grado. They pick up the victory. Um, their whole thing has been they've been on a losing streak, so Gama Singh has uh, been basically beating the crap out of them backstage. Last week, I think we saw him, or two weeks ago, saw him chase them with a broom. Uh, so after the match, Katarina grabs the microphone, and she belittles Grado, saying week after week he loses, he's pathetic, so on and so forth. She says that she does not love him, or she's not in love with him, but in love with his best friend, Joe Hendry. So now we all expected Joe and Katarina to get together and, you know, be the same old, same old wrestling heel turn. However, Joe grabs the microphone and said, well, what didn't you understand about platonic love? Uh, so... They have a little back and forth, and Joe ends up getting slapped, and Katarina leaves and goes to the back. So I was worried when this whole thing went down. I was like, oh, great. We're going to get great over Joe Hendry at Bound for Glory or something like that. Um, However, that doesn't seem to be the case. Kudos to Impact for going this route with it. Um, It seems like the Desi Hit Squad right now is being utilized to Further other feuds, we saw that with KM and Falaba, now with Joe Hendry and Grado, and I think that's just going to be where they're going to be for the time being, at least until they add the other members of the Desi Hit Squad, which we know nothing about, and I think that that is going to be their strength is size and numbers, or strength and numbers, whatever you want to call it, um, when eventually the other two members, if they ever come, because I mean... They're still rough around the edges. There there seems to be a lot of work that needs to be done to further them as a real threat. Um, but yeah, and I mean, it seems like Impact is going a little heavy with the comedy acts. We have Hendry and Grado. We have Cam and Fala Ba. Eli Drake and uh, The Cult of Lee. They were going on that for a while, but that seems to be... M- possibly moving in another direction, but, I mean, I I love comedy and wrestling, don't get me wrong, but I feel like when it's oversaturated, it kind of, eh, kind of takes away from it a little bit, but, eh, can't win everything, uh, then we see Grado and Joe backstage, and Joe says that he's mortified, and he should have seen the signs with Katarina calling him late at night, and all that other stuff, Grado says he trusts him, and then Joe says, you can always trust me, and, Eh, I, I don't know. I, I still think something's going to happen between the two of them. Then we get the GWN flashback, and that was when Bully Ray wins the uh, TNA heavyweight title. Um, then we get a Sue Young video to the sound of Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, and it ends with us seeing a coffin closing with Tessa's name on it, so another good video done there. Then we get Bobo singing to Scarlet in the back. I, I guess this is another comedy act as well. KM and Falaba thank Scarlet for her advice, and then she goes up to him and says that they need power and confidence, and would do, and she would do anything for a man like that. So KM has an idea. So that will continue. Um, I mean, they're always good. I, I like them as a tag team. I think they work well together, and Impact's at least doing something with the lower card and. The crowd loves them, so that's just a no-brainer. You go with what's hot. So then we have the Eli Drake Open Challenge. He comes out not even in ring gear. He's just got workout gear. Um, Calls out somebody to come answer his challenge, and we get Stone Rockwell. Um, I love the interaction between the two of them. Stone Rockwell is a fantastic character. I hope we do see more of him in the future. Um, He does have a Twitch show with Impact, so it wouldn't be a surprise that they end up bringing him onto the roster, or at least we see more of him. Uh, They have a very short match. Eli hits the gravy train, and that's it. So I I think that Impact might as well take a chance and go with a full-faced Eli Drake run. I mean, it seems like Impact is very heel-heavy, at least in the main event scene, and... He is building up little wins here and there, so we are building him up a little more. Um, But I I just feel like it's worth a shot to take. I mean, people love to boo him. They love Eli Drake because the crowd and him always go back and forth. 
And again, he's so good at being a heel that it's hard when you get the crowd reaction that he gets. So I, I think it's worth at least exploring for a face turn for Eli Drake and then try to run with it. it it's worth a shot. That's all I'm saying. Then we get uh, Lucha Brothers promo asking Brian Cage basically to team with them against OV. And then they I think they said that even if he doesn't team with them, they're not a threat. It was something to that extent. Uh, then we get Moose, Aries, and Cross, and they're in their own private room. Alicia barges in, asks what's going on, and then the Aries, I believe, said she'll find out along with everybody else. And then Alicia barges in yelling, and then Aries tells her to worry about her husband and not us. Then we have this knockouts championship rematch. Tessa Blanchard defending against Sue Young. I shouldn't say rematch. I should say Sue Young invoked her rematch clause. Um, some notable things. The bridesmaids were not at ringside with Sue Young. I mean, Sue Young's whole thing is her being a larger than life character, so to speak. Uh, so I think the bridesmaids not being at ringside kind of took away from her a little bit. Um, I mean, it was a decent match back and forth. I, I thought they were given, I think, a little over 10 minutes in the match, and, and they did well with it. I mean, it was pretty split. Tessa controlled in the beginning, and then Sue Young controlled after Tessa did what she always does and gets frustrated. She left the ring, uh, went to grab a chair. Her and the ref had a back and forth. She set a chair up. That's when Sue Young took advantage. Uh, Sue did hit a beautiful uh, somersault sent on onto Tessa when she was sitting on the chair. Uh, we did see Tessa hit a top rope cutter on Sue Young near fall there. Sue ends up setting up for the panic switch. Tessa counters it, hits the hammerlock DDT for the win. Uh, that this point, the undead bridesmaids come out. Tessa's distracted. Sue Young attacks her from behind. She hits her with the panic switch. She goes, rolls her out of the ring. They leave the coffin on the ramp. Tessa is about to be put in the coffin, and then we just randomly cut to commercial. One commercial, we cut back, and all of a sudden we see Allie and Kiera Hogan standing on the ramp, helping Tessa, and Tessa saying, I don't need friends. This was a pop TV screw-up, so I didn't actually go back and watch it or try to find a clip of it, but I, I guess this is going to continue, at least with Kiera, or probably Allie and Sue Young, I would assume they'll do something with. Um... Not good look on Pop's part, screwing stuff up. I mean, we all remember back when uh, they screwed up the entire telecast or broadcast, whatever, uh, years back. And then we got a Brian Cage promo, and the same thing happened. It cuts out in the middle, and it cut to what looked to be part of the Karate Kid movie. And then it cut back to Cage, and then it cut to commercial. And it was just totally screwed up. Uh, very aggravating, but, I mean, these things do happen. And we see Conan, no, no, Conan was not out of this. We see King enter a building. Conan's already sitting down. King sits down. They're meeting with a commission uh, because the children getting hurt or Richie getting run over. Um, so at least they're doing something about this. But they're told to cease fire until October 14th, and that is bound for glory. It will be the final war, and it will be a six-man tag. Uh, LAX and Conan versus the OGs and King at Bound for Glory. I would assume there would be some sort of stipulation added to this match. I don't see this being a straight-up wrestling match. Nothing shows that this should be a wrestling match after everything they've been through. Um, I do have one problem with this, and it has nothing to do with the six men involved in this. But after the match at... Slammiversary, and they were continuing the feud. It seemed like the tag titles were held hostage in this feud. We ha LAX has wrestled maybe once since Slammiversary. Um, it it might have been a squash match, even that. Uh, but yeah, the tag team division was almost overcrowded at one point. We were like, oh, there's so many tag teams now. It seems like they're going to do some, and then the tag titles get stuck in this feud. And this is going to run for another month. I think LAX, since we have the ceasefire thing, um, LAX should drop the titles in at the Mexico tapings to whoever. It really doesn't matter. Um, and then those titles can be defended at Bound for Glory. So that's another match added. Um, and then have LAX chase the titles after this is all over with. Because I would assume the OGs are probably gone after this and... Actually, you know what? Honestly, anything's possible at this point. Because um, then I wonder what King's role is going to be in everything else, or they're going to continue something. I don't know. 
Um, I'll speculate more as we get closer to the event. Um, but yeah, no, I absolutely think the tag titles need to come off LAX because they're suffering being wrapped up in this feud. Um, then up next, we learn that next week, Brian Cage is going to face Congo Kong and the Lucha Brothers are going to face the Cult of Lee. <sighs> Just sometimes these matches come out of nowhere. Um, Brian Cage and Kong, we saw them have a great match. Uh, I don't know why we're going to see another match. And the Lucha Brothers versus the Cult of Lee, that came out of nowhere as well, especially since it seemed like the Lucha Brothers were going to do something with OVE. But I guess we'll see where it goes from there. Or at least the Cult of Lee could have done something with Eli and said, you know what, to prove to you that we're not dummies or whatever, they, they could challenge the Lucha Bros. At least give us a segue into a reason the matches are happening uh up next we have a six-man tag that everybody was looking forward to and this is trey miguel zachary wentz and ace austin versus ove um when this match started it was pretty quick where i think it was trey and ace austin got knocked outside of the ring and it was zachary wentz and sammy callahan i think sammy callahan was setting up for the package pile driver and i was like crap this is gonna be a squash match and we all did not want a squash match however i think zachary had countered the move he went to the uh sammy ended up on the outside then trey got his uh a good move in zach got a move in and as austin got a move in and then they had a good back and forth um I think the match only lasted about four minutes, but we, we did see some flashes of good stuff from both teams. Uh, eventually, OVE puts away Ace Austin with the all-seeing eye, and Sammy grabs the microphone and says, the stuff with Pentagon and Phoenix is never over, and then he brings up Brian Cage, so I would assume we will get that six-man tag at one point, uh, probably during the Mexico tapings. We will see. Interested to see what everybody role, everybody's role in this is going to be at Bound for Glory. Because um, it would definitely be not a good move to put like that six-man tag on Bound for Glory. Because there's too much going on with all those guys for, for us to settle for something like that. Um, and that brings us to the main event segment. And we are going to learn why Moose has turned his back on Eddie Edwards and joined Austin Aries and Killer Cross. So Moose comes out. He's got some interesting attire on. I believe he's referred to as Money Moose now. Um, he basically says that Eddie is a fraud. And he said Moose says he was there for Eddie with all of his issues with Sammy Callahan and uh, when he was going crazy and the stuff with Tommy Dreamer. And then when Moose had his match with Austin Aries and he got a concussion, he was in the hospital. Eddie was nowhere to be found. Uh, Cross was actually the only one to show up, and then Ares apparently called Moose, and Ares told Moose that he will never be the number one guy if he caters to all these idiots, obviously talking about the fans, um, and that was good, I, I, I mean, he'll making good points, you know, that, that makes sense, and then this is when I really was confused at why the segment went this way, uh, Ares started talking about himself, saying that no one was taking taking the title from around his waist, and then this brought out Johnny Impact. He runs down the heels, and he says he signed a contract to face Austin Aries at Bound for Glory, and I'm kind of like, what? I, I thought you were in a program with Congo Kong. And then I guess what happened between the two of them at that pool, or at poolside, that ended the feud? I I'm just kind of confused here. Um, I believe Aries and Johnny Impact faced off at Crossroads, and they had a good program together. I, I have no worries about the match quality because it's, the two of them are very capable of putting on a fantastic match. It was just kind of strange that it came out of nowhere. Um, I would expect that we will get Moose versus Eddie Edwards, but that kind of leaves Killer Cross up in the air. Um, I don't know. I don't know where they're going to go here. Maybe maybe this is your chance to put Eli Drake here and have him face Killer Cross. However, there's no good outcome with that because you want to build up both these guys again. So that's, that's what I'm confused about. Um, so obviously, Johnny's running down the heels. He makes a little dick joke at Austin Aries. Aries takes offense to that. He goes and fights with Impact on the stage. Obviously, Impact holds his own. And he eventually gets triple teamed. So they end up doing the same thing they did to Johnny Impact that they did to Austin, uh, that they did to Eddie Edwards last week. And that's how we ended the show. 
Um, not the strongest main event, but like I said, just kind of came out of nowhere. And I think a lot of people are on the or have the same feeling about this as well. Um, let me see. I wanted to go over something, and I just forgot what I was talking about. Oh, um, so it seems like the last couple of weeks, uh, probably post Slammiversary, every show has had at least one really strong match on it. Um, and this show really didn't have any standout match. I mean, the knockout title match was good. Everything was solid, but nothing to stand out. And I figured the storytelling was kind of going to pick up and take care of that, that we didn't need a strong match. However, some things kind of fell flat. Um, like I said, it wasn't a bad episode. Just uh, kind of spinning their wheels since... I'm almost resting on their laurels a little bit from Slammiversary. Um, no more really pushing the envelope at this point. Um, but yeah, like I said, it's, it's going to be interesting. I think we're going to get... A huge push toward Bound for Glory at the Mexico tapings. I think we're gonna we're in for some good stuff there. Um, kind of new territory for them to run in. So I'm looking forward to it. Bound for Glory should be good. Um, I'm gonna be a little more critical probably on the Bound for Glory card as we build toward it, just for the simple fact that I'm going to be there live. Um, so that that's just one thing. But that's pretty much all I have for you guys this week. Um, hopefully, I'll catch you guys on Sunday for an impact report. I might have it up earlier. I might have it up later. I might not even do one. Not sure since we have the impact versus the UK at noon on Sunday, Eastern Standard Time. So I will be watching that. Um, but yeah, hope you guys enjoyed the show. I hate to be the fact that I was a little more critical than usual. But, you know, there's room for improvement and... Obviously, it's all opinion, so everyone has one. But thanks for checking out my video, and until next time, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Thanks, guys. Bye.